Are you excited, Wayne? Oh, are you kidding me? For for our next speaker, I am. I am. Yeah. I am excited. Yeah. This is uh, really it's, awesome. It's, Exactly. So it's it's my pleasure to um, to welcome now Mr. Joe Torrey. Um, I'll try to summarize uh, some uh, some of his accomplishment. Uh, I'll try to be quick because uh, I could go forever. Um, Mr. Torrey is the uh, special assistant of the commissioner of, of baseball. Um, and a couple of facts here. Um, and Wayne, I don't know if you know about that. He's number five on the all time. Uh, winning list um, of wins in MLB as a manager with 2,326. And just wait for this one. He's the only ma manager with 2,000 wins and 2,000 hits as a player. That's quite amazing. Um, managed the New York Yankees for 12 seasons. And each of those seasons where it, where it was able to bring them to postseason and won four World Series. He's also the founder of the um, foundation called Safe at Home uh, that comes and support uh, children exposed to violence and abuse. It is my real pleasure uh, to welcome Joe Torrey on Time Out 2020. Mr. Torrey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's uh, very interesting. Debbie was dynamite. She was, she was great to listen to. She was, she was. So for, for, for coaches uh, watching right now, uh, it's, it is going to be a Q&A session. Uh, so if you have questions for Mr. Mr. Torrey, I know some of you have sent those questions to, to me earlier that I'm going um, to talk about, uh, but you can use a Q&A box there if you, have, if you have some. I'll start with the first one, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Torrey. Sure. The first one, the first one, and I, I got tons of coaches uh, asking for, me. First to ask thing, you, the, the first thing, you have to call me Joe. Uh, it's like that's keep, all right. Keep looking for somebody else when you call Mr. Tory. So that's perfect. All right. Okay, okay. Well, Joe, I got a, I got a question that I received from many, many coaches, uh, especially after this last uh, World Series. Uh, there, there's kind of a debate right now about the use of advanced statistics, advanced data. Uh, and some coaches are saying, you know, it, it takes away from the instinct of, of, of a manager, of a coach during the course of the game. I'm just curious to know how you feel about that, how, how, how Joe would manage in today's world with all those statistics and everything. Uh, so that's a question we got. And that's my first question. Well, that, that was that's a great question <laughs> because I, I keep scratching my head sometimes when um, – you know, I watch a game and it doesn't seem like the same game that I was involved with. Um, analytics are important. There's no question. The more information you have, uh, probably the better decisions you make. But the one thing you mentioned uh, was instinct. And, and I think that's so important to our game. I mean, I, I look at our game uh, as a game of life, you know, there are so many things that are unpredictable. I mean, uh, the, the ninth inning of the uh, game seven of the world series between uh, Cleveland and the Cubs, you know, and, uh, and no analytics will tell you that that little infield is going to come off the bench and hit a home run uh, to tie the game. I mean, th there are so many things that happen in baseball that uh, you going in, you certainly don't plan for. But, you know, watching the World Series, and I'm a big fan of Kevin Cash, the, the manager uh, of Tampa Bay, because I think he's developed into a fine, uh, a fine manager. And, and again, I, be, having been a manager for almost 30 years, uh, you know, I think second guessing is – is part of the game. I, I think that's what the fans are entitled to do because they're sitting there at home and everybody's probably played one form of baseball uh, in their careers, whether it's rolling a dice or spinning a dial or out on, you know, in the street or on the field. So, uh, but that particular one that's been called into question since the world series was Blake Snell, his starter. Uh, he had gone through five innings, I guess it was, uh, pretty uh, even, easily, and he made a decision to take him out. Uh, you know, I was surprised, uh, but again, uh, managers know their players. And, you know, evidently they've had a lot of uh, information that was accrued and, uh, and 
involving Blake Snell, uh, and they felt that the next time through the lineup, he could get in trouble. That I, I, again, am I going to question the move? No, I'm not going to question the move because Kevin did this all year long. So I, I could never question that. I, I just uh, question the analytics taking over as opposed to allowing the coaches or the managers to use their instincts. Uh, there's so much that, that can be decided by looking in somebody's eye and not on a piece of paper. And I, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, not an analytics fan uh, as I say, it, it, you know, information's important, but I, I've told every manager, you know, in my position, and I, I've been with uh, MLB now for 10 years, and I speak to managers uh, on an ongoing basis, and I always tell them, I know analytics are a part, big part of the game, but don't ever lose the fact that you need to use your instincts. Uh, instincts are so important. You play this game and you just have a sense of what you want to do. And to me, analytics, the only thing that does for you is to give you uh, an excuse for something going wrong. Well, it wasn't supposed to happen, but that doesn't mean it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a long way to get to the answer is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more into a, a field type, uh, uh, decision maker. Uh, and again, you can't ignore information, but I, I can't have it take over the game. Yeah. And you mentioned something really important. And before I, I let Wayne ask the, 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 the question, I've read this book several times. That, that's your book, right? And you mentioned something while answering my first question about the importance of knowing your athletes, knowing your player as well. Can you give us a little bit of perspective on, on practical examples on what you did with the years that you were coaching the Yankees or the other teams that you managed um, that you did in order to get to know them a little bit better? Sometimes like knowing there's some language barriers with Japanese and Spanish um, players coming from Latin countries. So, so is there anything that you've done in order to get that connection with the players? You know, I, I think a big part of, of, being a successful manager or a leader, no matter what line of work you're in, you've got to listen. You've got to listen. Yeah. You know, I know managers tell people what to do, but, but you have to listen. So it gives you a sense of knowing your player. Uh, and I, 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 I always try to have players feel that I'm loyal to them, which I, I am, but, over and above that, I have to be loyal to the 25 or now 26, uh, uh, loyal to the team before I'm loyal to the individual. I, that, that's more important. But the, um, the, the, the thing about it is you have to listen, but you're right about when you have to talk through an interpreter, uh, you know, to say a Japanese player or a Spanish player, because sometimes they will say something that means something different, you know, in, in, yeah. in the English language than it does, you know, in uh, say Japanese. So it's, it's, you have to, you have to ask more questions basically, because if the question or if the answer comes out where you're, you're, you're wondering, uh, then, then I think you got to dig a little deeper. But to me, you've got to watch, you, you, you know, you, you've got to listen. And, and to me, getting to know your players is so important because, uh, you know, you have to put players in a position where they, they have a better chance to succeed. And knowing the player is, uh, is so imperative and, and because I was very lucky in my, my years with the Yankees, I had a guy named Derek Jeter and, and Derek Jeter. Uh, I, I think this, this bodes well and, and doesn't matter what you do for a living. You can't be afraid to fail. You know, we have so many people that don't want to mess this up or I'm, af I'm afraid to do that. You know, what makes winning and being successful so exciting 
is how close you could have come to failing. And I, and I think the, the fact that you have to commit yourself, no matter what the result is, is, is the most important thing. And, and Derek Jeter was that guy. And that makes you walk out of the clubhouse with your head held high. Not that you're happy about losing, but you knew that you did the best you could. And that's, you know, one thing about our game is, in, is you know, do the best you can. That's all I've ever asked players. It's probably helped that I managed the Mets to start with when we weren't very good and managed some teams that weren't very good. When you try to find a motivational tool, it's basically just do the best you can. Do the best you can. But that means running hard to first base. That doesn't mean when you hit a pop-up, you say jog to first base. you got to run hard, play the game hard, because you owe it to your teammates for that to be the case. So um, I, I think the, uh, the, the understanding of your players is so very important because you're going to have to make uh, some vital decisions uh, at key points in the game. Thank you, Wayne. I know, I know the Q&A box is going crazy right now, but I'll let you pick one of them. <laughs> yeah, Joe, our Q&A box is just lighting up here. This is fantastic. And for all the coaches that are out there, we're obviously not going to be able to get to all the questions uh, with the time that we have today, but thank that's you. That's because I'm long-winded too. Wayne, yes, so that's it's all problem. good. It's, it's riveting. And, and, you know, the impressive thing here is, first of all, the craftsmanship with which you uh, put down the answer to the original question around data and analytics and so forth. I love that, that's fantastic. And your comments are aligning so well with what we're doing here today around culture and, and specifically listening. Uh, that, those are strong, powerful messages. Uh, Roger Archambault comes with a question and it's related to some of the others that I see in the chat box here. Uh, what's the biggest shift you had to make personally in your coaching career and why? Now, that can be, yeah, that can be during coaching or transitioning from athlete to coach. What's the biggest shift you had to make? Uh, yeah, basically, the flexibility is so important in our game. And, you know, you go from generation to generation. You know, you play the game, and I'm talking about myself, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, now uh, I'm managing in the 90s, and, and they're uh, – you know, I always um, I always felt our clubhouse was a sanctuary and it, it belonged to the players. Um, and I think the certain shifts I had to make and, you know, all the players like music. And, you know, I, I walked in the clubhouses where I hear seven different types of music. <laughs> and I just said, guys, uh, if you can all agree on the same music, you can play it in, in the clubhouse. Uh, and otherwise just put a headset on and listen to what you want. You know, I never told guys they couldn't do this or couldn't do that. And I, I made an allowance uh, when I was managing the Yankees for David Wells, who was a little bit unusual. You guys had him up there in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and David liked to listen to this um uh, you know, heavy metal and, you know, stuff that I wouldn't even think of uh, tuning into. But I, you know, he wanted to listen to it. He wanted it to be loud. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll ask the players if they want to do this. If it's OK, the day you pitch to have you do this, then I'll give in, which I had to give in because the players, again, I had a great group. I had an unselfish group. They would help anybody try to do something that would make them better uh, in playing the game. So if it, it helped them, everybody sort of bit the bullet and, and, and allowed you to do it. I think from generation to generation, Wayne, you, you've got to make adjustments because these players that walk into the clubhouse are no different than the young player, the young people that are walking out there, you know, in, 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 in different professions or, or different jobs. So you've got to keep that in mind that players are different. Uh, you've got to try to understand them. Uh, and, and that's why it goes back to listening again and, and just 
getting a sense of body language and, and again, their effect on their teammates. I, I mean, I, I had one player when I was managing the Cardinals, he, the pitcher come over to me and he said, I'd like to have such and such catch me instead of, you know, the, what was the normal, the regular catcher. And I said, why is that? Because I, I never wanted to be held hostage by something like that. So what happened, unbe- I mean, not unbeknownst, but I was sitting there with the pitcher and I called that catcher. He didn't want to throw to over to our little conversation. And I, I made them work it out. I said, I can't, I can't do this. I, I can't be locked into something if, if there's a way we can solve it. I always try to solve the problem. And at times there, you know, it's not solvable, but I'm always going to try. So uh, I, I think flexibility as a manager, uh, and I know there are certain managers that are pretty steadfast in the way they do things and they want people to conform to them. I think it's important that coaches and managers are able to conform uh, to personalities without sacrificing you know, what's best for the team. I would, I, I would never do that. I would never, you know, I've heard, uh, I've heard some managers say, oh yeah, he can show up late too if he hit 40 home runs. No, everybody's got to follow the same set of rules because I, I think that's, uh, that's so very important. It's all about the discipline that really the players crave, you know, whether they, they know it or not. They, they, they do crave the attention and and the fact that you can listen to them. Awesome. Uh, Joe, Joe, we got one of our team member, Josh. Josh, if you're listening, I'll, I'll ask you to open your cam. I'll put you on the spot here. I know you want to ask Joe a question. So the floor is yours, buddy. Absolutely, Joe. It is, an, it is a pleasure to be uh, in the same room as you. I'm uh, very excited to chat. So uh, I'd I'd like to preface this a little bit, but my name is Josh and I'm a huge lover of the sport of baseball. I'm a youth coach, played in college. And um, one day I want to impact this game on a really large scale. And I really believe that's my impact is going to be with the kids. And as someone who has literally impacted this game at every single turn, you are a pillar of wisdom. You're a sage of our sport. And it's not just because of all the world series and and gold medals. And, you know, there was some struggles and I was doing some homework and I knew that in 1971, you had won an MVP award. And then in 1972, there was an MLB 13 day strike due to a, uh, it was the MLB, it was a pension thing, I believe. Um, Yeah, we went on strike, right? Yeah. And, and I remember uh, what I read in that quote, this was an article from like 1981 on the New York times, but uh, you had said that you didn't understand how at 19, 1972 opening day, these guys could boo you, um, despite you being the MVP the year before and the batting champ, you know? So when you, when you hear about experiences like that, or you hear about like Mike Messina telling you, no, you stay there when you wanted to pull up <laughs> out of the game, um, <laughs> You know, the thing that made that funny, Josh, with, with Mike Messina, he wasn't that guy. Yeah, he did. He, he he'd hardly ever opened his mouth. And that's, that was comical to me. But go ahead, finish your thought. <laughs> no, you know, all I wanted to say was you've reached the pinnacle of our sport in so many different ways and and and, and not without hardships. So, you know, for the kids that I coach and for the coaches on this call who have those aspirations of of, you know, modeling a career in a similar sense that you have done or modeling a pathway that you have, you know, when you have a moment of extreme adversity or a moment that goes against the grain, what do you do to keep moving forward? Well, you you deal with it. You don't try to hide from it. I think that's the most important thing. You know, baseball is a little different than other sports. Uh, And I, I, really strongly feel this way at some point during the season, of course you have 162 games normally, and uh, that somebody's going to be in a position to do something important. And during that year, I need to have every player feel significant. You know, they all can't hit 30 home runs or, or strike out 10 guys, but they can all feel like they're part of the team. And 
I thought that was uh, really first and foremost. What you referred to in 1972, I was one of the player reps when we went on strike for the first time. In, in, and it was over the pension because at the time that the owners wouldn't let us have anything to say about, you know, uh, where the pension money goes and, and whatever it was or it, contributing money to the pension. So we went on strike. And then, you know, opening day in St. Louis, and I was playing for the Cardinals at the time, you know, I got booed opening day. I did understand it, but it really hurt. It really hurt. I mean, I had a, uh, you know, a great year the year before. And, but again, you know, it was about, and, and I understood the fact that, you know, at that point we were blamed for the strike, the players, and, you know, we cheated the people out of baseball for a week, basically, you know? And so uh, I was a player and you're going to, uh, again, when you're in a position like I was as a player rep, you, you know, you're going to, it's going to fall on you. And, but it, it, it was tough for me to get over. And I, you know, I, I, I hit decent that year, but I, uh, I really put a lot of pressure on myself for that. So you're right. There's the human aspect of it. Uh, the Mike Messina, that, 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 that was one of the hysterical things when I went out there and I didn't even remember, I was, I was reminded, uh, about it. And then I talked it over with Mike, but Mike was one of the, the special people, but again, he, he hardly made any noise. He, I mean, he, he you know, he, you'd have to pull it out of him, although he did have this wry sense of humor, you know, and I, I think that part that was part of the reaction he had when I went out to the mound. Um, but uh, Andy Pettit, who was another one of my favorites, you know, Andy, every time, uh, every time I went out to take Andy out of a game, he'd burn a hole through me just by staring at me, you know, and, and, and you know, he'd reluctantly give me the ball and uh, every single time, Andy would stop in my, my office before he went home and he apologized for showing me up. And I said, Andy, you didn't show me up. I never want you to want to come out of a game, you know? So I, I don't have no problem with that, but you know, issues has, they have to be dealt with. And I had one player who I pinched hit for, uh, when we were, I think we were in Fenway and I pinched hit for him and, and he was, he was a good player. Well, he left the ballpark. He left the ballpark before the game is over and that's an unwritten rule. And, and I basically said to Brian Cashman, I, he's not on my team anymore because that, that was all about him and not the team. I, the team has to come first for me. And um, so you, you, you really have to deal with it. And, and I'm, Josh, I'm not a confrontational guy. I don't like confrontation, but there are certain things you have to do. And, and um, you know, because you pinch it for guys and, you know, they'll come in after the game and, and whine about it, complain about it. Most of them just take it. And I, I never ask players to like what I do or agree with what I do, but just respect with the fact that, it's my job to make those decisions. And um, I had a thing, you get a kick out of this. I had a player, John Stearns, who was a catcher when I was managing the Mets. And John would always have his own opinion on the way I managed, you know, and this was my first try at managing. And, you know, he was always more, he was a pain in the ass is what he was, you know, but he, I, I liked him, you know, he, he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. So, you know, he always had questions on why I did this, why I did that. Well, at the end of the season, the game didn't mean anything, the last game of the season. And I got permission from the other uh, manager and, and the umpires, and I let John manage the last game of the season. Well, it was about inning three. He come up to me and wanted to know, you know, wanted to ask me a question. I said, don't, don't ask me a question. I said, you had all the answers during the year. Well, go ahead and, you know, and run it out there. Well, it wound up being something I did every single year, as long as the game didn't mean anything. Uh, and uh, it, it got to be uh, a lot of fun because, you know, you just want the players to understand 
that, you know, you sure you want them to play. I have to make decisions. I make decisions on the team that I think can win that particular day and, you know, and, and just let them know, or they have to know they, no matter what I tell them, they have to know that there's no other reason than trying to win a game that I'm making this decision. I know I've been accused of, oh, this guy makes money. That's why he's playing. I've never let that influence me. And of course, I heard about it uh, many, many times in the postseason when I batted Alex Rodriguez eighth. And uh, so, but um, yeah, I always try to be fair, Josh. That's all you can do. Make the kids feel significant and, um, and, and try to be fair. Joe, I had, um, and thanks, Josh, for the great question. Thanks, Joe, for that great answer. Um, I had tons of other questions. Unfortunately, we, we were running out of time a little bit, but I had questions on um, w- what you're looking at when you select assistant coaches. I had the question about dealing with tough buses also because you've dealt with tough buses. Uh, yeah, well, let, yeah, I'll tell you, that as coaches, I, I think it's so important. You want to surround yourself with people that are going to help you win. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember someone asked me one time, you know, you're surrounding yourself with guys who are former managers, you know, and aren't you afraid that, you know, that they'd be tempted to make a change if things went bad. I, you know, first off, I'm not thinking negatively. I, I, I want to try to win. And I insist that my coaches and even my trainer and my coaches in spring training, where we have minor league coaches, if they see something and, and would like to make a suggestion, I want to hear them. I, I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, and I, the more information I can get from people who have played the game or have been around the game, I, I want that. So I, um, I, I always try to hire coaches that are going to tell me the truth. I don't want a coach to agree with me because I make a decision. I want the coach to tell me the truth. And so I, yeah, I've hired some some guys who, uh, you know, weren't shy about telling you the truth and, and it worked for me because, uh, I think you got to think in terms of doing your job instead of worrying about keeping your job. And, um, you know, that's the way I am. As far as tough bosses, I've had some beauties to be honest with you, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, and we know one, <laughs> don't forget I had Ted Turner and, uh, and then, uh, August Bush in St. Louis. And of course, George, I thought in all fairness, I think I got George on the back nine though. You know, he, he was getting a little older and uh, it got to the point when we were struggling a little bit, I used to pick up the phone and call George and, you know, I, I sort of disarm him. I'd say, George, what am I doing wrong? I said, I, I, I don't understand. He's all, you'll be all right. I caught him off guard. So I found out, uh, you know, things that, uh, that worked with me and George. We had a great relationship. And um, of course he gave me the opportunity to manage, in my opinion, the, the, you know, the best group of guys. And a big thing that I didn't mention earlier is the fact, Wayne, that, you know, I know players have ability and you got to pick a lot of them according to their ability, but character is so important because you, you really got to have those players who can handle failure, uh, everybody can pretty much handle success, but handling failure is so important. You watch the great golfers when, you know, when they get a six on a hole, you know, they just turn the page and they, they go to the next hole. Sometimes the guys who aren't quite there yet will watch it just, you know, collapse and fall, you know, and then they just fall off the, the page. But, um, you know, character is so important. That's when things are close, character is going to win more games for you. Totally. Um, I, I'm uh, watching the chat box. Everyone's like me. We could continue this conversation forever. <laughs> um, one, one, one thing I'd like to give you the opportunity. We mentioned your foundation earlier, Joe. Oh, right. Uh, Safe at Home Foundation. Would you like to say um, coaches and participants um, in, in the room right now a little bit more about it? Yeah, I, I was raised and my 
dad was abusive to my mom and, and it affected me being the youngest of five children. And, you know, I, I witnessed as an eight or nine year old, my dad threatening my mom with a gun and, and stuff. And I never realized what he was doing was affecting me until I was, you know, a shy kid, nervous kid, uh, low self-esteem. I thought I was just born that way. I realized later on that this, this was created. So when we got to the Yankees, my wife, Allie said, what kind of charity should we get involved with? I said, how about domestic violence, which sort of caught her by surprise. So we have safe rooms in schools. Um, and I named the safe rooms after my mom, Margaret's place. And there's counselors we put in there and um, we just give these kids the tools, uh, you know, the kids who have domestic violence or abuse in their lives, have them talk about it. I never talked about it with anybody and, <clears throat> you know, make sure that we make them feel a lot better about themselves than uh, I know I did as a youngster, but I was just very fortunate to have the ability to play baseball that I didn't go in the wrong direction. So we've, we've had a uh, hundred, a hundred thousand kids come through our program and, it's, uh, you know, we just make sure that they know somebody cares about, uh, you know, how they're doing and we give them tools to deal with the abuse. It's been tough during the pandemic because a lot of schools are closed and we, you know, we have to stay in touch with these kids, even though they're home. It's not necessarily safe for them to be at home, but we had no choice and we've been pretty fortunate to be in, in touch with them. People who want to know more about it, it it's joetory.org, and, and they'll get the information. But uh, thanks for asking, Wayne. It's uh, something very close to our hearts. And we, we are posting the information also in, in the chat box, uh, Joe, for people to visit and, and donate as well. Uh, Joe, I, wa I want to thank you. You've been really, really generous of your time today. Um, I, like I said, we could have kept going um, <laughs> for, for a long period of time. Um, well, we'll do it again. We'll do let's it do it again. Yeah, let's do it again. I, I appreciate your time. I want to wish you also a great holiday seasons, a fantastic or better 2021. I think we're all looking forward for 2020 to be finished yeah. and move on to 2021. Uh, so yeah, yeah, like like people are saying, let's do it again, like for sure. So we'll uh, we'll keep that in mind for the future. Thanks a lot for your generosity uh, on behalf of everyone here in the room today. And uh, again, happy holidays to you and your family. All right. Be safe. Be healthy. Take care. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.